so we're back at it again. Um, we've got a really good uh, discussion lined up for us today. And who I've got working with me today, it's through a connection, uh, through a connection with Colonel House. Uh, we've got full bird, Colonel Jackson, Kevin Jackson today. And he's gonna come and talk with us about uh, mission command in a complex world. And I hope that you enjoy the discussion today. So without further ado, let's introduce Colonel Jackson. Colonel Jackson, how are you doing, sir? Hey, doing well, Otis, how you doing? I'm doing well, doing well, doing well. It's a good day, a good day for discussion. It's a good day for just talking and sharing good information. It's a good day for mentorship. It's a good army day, as a lot of my friends always like to say. Um, and so I'm thrilled that you you decide to join us today to just have a conversation on things that I'm sure that you're the subject matter expert on. And we've got about 21 or so uh, presentation slides that we jazzed up a little bit to make it uh, visually appealing and informative at the same time. But before we even get into the slides, before we even go there, sir, introduce yourself. Tell us who, who are you and what you're all about. All right, I hope everybody can hear me. I'm uh, Colonel Kevin Jackson, uh, who I am. Um, basically, I'm an Army guy. i uh, from Chicago, Illinois. Uh, mom and dad, both uh, hardworking. Mom was a social worker. Dad was uh, a, a cop uh, for 25 years. Uh, I'm an ROTC graduate from North Dakota State University and uh, joined the Army in 97 and basically did all the uh, jobs of field artillery um, I stayed at the operational level probably for the first 13 years of my career mm -hmm. uh, in Fort Campbell, Germany, uh, Fort Lewis, uh, and then commanded at Fort Drum. Uh, after Fort Drum, kind of different operational experience. Uh, I went to the War College and then uh, proceeded to go to the Joint Staff for two years. I worked the uh, Middle East desk, what we call job sent, basically the CENTCOM AOR uh, in the Joint Staff. Awesome assignment. Uh, very high tempo, a lot of hours. And then uh, this last summer, uh, I've currently worked in the Secretary of Defense's office uh, oh, in man. OSD policy, uh, and I'm the Afghanistan country director. So I work a lot of the uh, issues and really the money side, the resources side uh, of Afghanistan. So that's who I am. And I'm just uh, happy to be here with you guys today. And, and uh, this is such an important mentorship and it's important to me. And I think it's really, uh, really good of what I've, what I've been seeing over the last month and what you guys have been doing, Otis. Okay, okay, okay. Now, we really appreciate you coming and just talking with us. Um, you know, Afghanistan is still going on. A lot of folks just may have this misinterpretation that, eh, Afghanistan, we're, we're not worried about that. That's not going on. So I'm glad to see an actual face with uh, someone who has a very important role with what's going on over there. So we really, really appreciate it. Um, we really, really appreciate it you coming and joining us. Uh, thank you. Okay, and I've got to say, the, uh, um, oh, oh, go ahead, sir, go ahead. No, um, you know, I was really wanted to start off with uh, how the environment's changed. So, you know, this is, this is a mission command in a complex world. And when you look at the army and what the army's been through, uh, it's really almost been two armies for, for guys like me and guys that came in and you know, the late 90s, uh, before before OIF started, uh, we were training hard and we were training for a wartime mission, primarily against, uh, you know, a Russia type scenario, uh, you know, for a full spectrum of conflict. Uh, and so you went to the field a lot, you learned your craft, you got a lot of operational experience. Uh, after OIF and coming back, uh, I think it changed the Army, especially quite a bit. Uh, where there was a different focus. There was a focus on training for your deployment. You know, we used to call your D metal. Uh, and that really, you know, when it came down to training and, and learning and making good leaders, it was all geared towards deployment, but not to your craft, whatever that may be mm -hmm. uh, at large. And so uh, that's created a real difference. And what you've seen from the Army in the last couple of years is how do you move back to do unify land operations against a you know against a near peer threat and so i think that's just an important dynamic uh that i wanted to discuss because uh you know a lot of guys you know i have five deployments 
um, you know, to Afghanistan, one Afghanistan, three to Iraq, and then Kosovo uh, before that. Uh, and, and I think I, I just see that shift. And as I got, you know, to battalion command, I could definitely see uh, how that had changed. And I had to change. I had to change how I how I view training. How do you get back to objective T and the task that's going to, you know, work on a proficiency and some type mm -hmm. of progression uh, in, in your craft? OK, OK. Now, sir, I've got to say, you know, a lot of the slides, a lot of the information that you gave to me seems very military but you know we're blessed to have both a military and a civilian audience checking it out and trying to get some sort of working knowledge from you so if at all possible while you're talking and sharing the information military wise try to make a comparison that a civilian can appreciate and a civilian can learn from as well so i'm just going to ask uh, of you, of you for that when while we're talking and everything like that. Oh, a absolutely. That's a, that's a great point. Uh, I think when you when you look at mission command, you know, and I won't say it's a buzzword, but how the army characterizes it, um, it's really about leadership. So I think it applies to all type of leaders at you know the direct level, whether you're civilian or military. It's really what what does an organizational leader do. For, what are the things they do to train, whether they're trained there on skills in the uh, in the military or train skills towards a certain job or profession. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's kind of what we'll get into is really it, it really is based around leadership, you know, fundamentals that will help you, uh, you know, these little nit, you know, tidbits that will help you uh, no matter what profession you're in. Okay. All right, sir. So let's go ahead and jump into the first slide. OK, so the first one talks about working harder. Talk to us, sir, what's this all about? So no matter what type of organization you're in, if you're a civilian or if you're in the military, uh, I think your number one job is to train your people uh, to accomplish the mission of the organization. And so if you're in the military, that means you know, you're training on your wartime mission. And so people may be in jobs for different reasons. They may have joined the army for different reasons. Uh, but when, when it gets down to it, uh, it's really the focus of why you're there. There's always going to be these ancillary tasks, you know, that are out there. But the larger focus is is kind of the vision and the purpose of the organization. And so to get to this, the leader of the organization uh, has to set, you know, kind of always had the saying is, hey, you the leader always has to tell everybody where they're going. What's the end state? What's the larger purpose? And so how do you. So what I really wanted to get to is how do you do that? And so, uh, you know, priorities. What is your boss's priorities? Mm -hmm. What does the company see as, hey, what's success? Where, what's the goal you're trying to achieve? Is it a metric goal? Is it we want to be at a certain training proficiency? And so I think everybody in the organization, you know, in, a, in the military, we talk, hey, two levels up. What does what your boss's boss think? You know, mm -hmm. one person described to me, uh, once, hey, if you really want to have success in Tanker on Jackson, hey, solve your boss's boss's problems. And so if you can do that, you're definitely being successful. Uh, and, and so as you look at, you know, the training, do you understand how to do that? Do you understand how to lead teams, how to train teams to accomplish a mission, you know, how to solve complex problems in your organization to be able to do that? And so in the Army, you know, we have, you know, objective T, which really gets into, hey, here's here's certain gates that you have to meet to do that. Uh, so if you're, you know, if you're an apprentice, you have to do certain things to get to uh, certain levels. And, and it's the same concept in the Army uh, as a field grade officer or as a, a junior executive. You've got to understand how does your organization move to be competent. And so I think that that's important that. You know, if you're leading a operation or you are leading a task that's that that's been assigned to you, how do you do that? I think it I think it's important that you understand what are those gates? What are those metrics we're looking for? How do you define success? How many people uh, need to be at this training for it to be successful so that you're providing good quality feedback to the leader uh, of that organization? And I think is as you do that. Um, you know, you have to think about well, how do I get there? And so mm -hmm. how you get there is, you know, you have to have well-resourced 
training. Mm -hmm. Nobody in any environment, military, civilian, they, they don't want their time wasted. And so you yeah. see in a lot of organizations, people are just sitting around for task management. Um, well, this guy's working like, you know, you know till uh, 8 p.m., you know, 2800 and the other person is on Facebook. So how do you balance the, how do you balance the tasks across your organization? And then how do you if you're going to do a training event, how do you bring the knowledge base to the same level? So mm -hmm. one thing I was concerned with as a battalion commander is you're going to have people in the organization. Some are going to be operating at a high level. They're not going to need mm -hmm. much your help. They're not going to need much training. But then you're always worried about the person at the bottom or the middle. Yeah. How do you get your organization to a, a common point? What is the training that you can do to bring everybody up to a certain level? You, the, yeah. the people that are, are knocking it out the park and are experienced and doing great, they're going to still be great. But if you can get the common base, the whole organization will, you know, will flourish uh, in, in that environment. Excellent points. Appreciate it. Jumping on to the next one, sir. Okay. All right. It says leaders must be Being prepared. prepared. <laughs> what is this all about? Right. Uh, you know, I've been really thinking about this point for the last couple of days. And so uh, I think a couple of days ago, Colonel Wagner had a post on there, but one of the majors was talking about preparation. I think preparation is the most underrated and, and, and we don't talk about it a lot. Because we're like, well, uh, I'm a major now. You know, I'm one of two in the organization, or I'm the I'm a CEO. I'm the I'm the project manager. And in my experience, I think the higher you get, the more you have to prepare because it's expected of you. You have to know your job code. And so I think, and and I think we, you know, we don't put the time in to really, you know, preparation to me is like an operation. Mm -hmm. I want to write it out. What am I doing? And so an example, uh, when I went into battalion command, 30 days off, right? I took 30 days leave, which, you know, don't do a lot. But what I wanted to do was I made a, a, a basically a training schedule for myself. The first week was tactical proficiency. The second week, I want to learn all the problems that are happening in organizations around, you know, what, what issues are they dealing with? But part of mm -hmm. that is I wanted to make sure from day one, when you arrive day one, you've got to be ready. Mm -hmm. uh, the more senior you are, you don't get, I'm the new guy. You can use that as a, you know, a junior leader, you know, mid grade leader, but when you become, you know, a senior or, you know, middle management or, mm -hmm. or a field grade officer or a battalion commander, you gotta be ready to day one. One example, my first day in command as a battalion commander, mm -hmm. I had serious misconduct violation. I, you know, we wind up relieving a first sergeant. And I'll tell you, I don't know if I was ready the first day. Was I, was I read in on all what the proper UCMJ procedures were? Mm -hmm. Who was I supposed to contact? All, all of those things and, and being ready. And so this preparation, I think, is, uh, is absolutely uh, essential. And then because you have to, too, as you become, you know, a field grade officer or middle management, you also have to understand, well, what if, what if we did this training or what if people's performance aren't meeting the gates. Well, you need to know the gates and you need to know what those requirements are. Hey, did the unit meet the standards of performance? Are they being met? And then you have to have the fortitude to go back to the commander or if you're the commander say, hey, we're going to do it again. Or, hey, these people mm -hmm. are going to work on the weekend because it's not met the standard. Oh, wow. and, and so I think uh, I think you really have to, you know, be, be prepared to be able to do that. Uh, and then another experience that I've had is when you're talking to a senior leader in an organization and you represent your organization, if you're a battalion commander or a field grade officer, when the boss asks you a question, I know we, we always say sometimes that I'm going to go look that up. That, that, in my experience, the more senior you get, that really doesn't work when it's part mm -hmm. of your craft. And so you, no matter what uh, you know, specialty you're in, no matter what field you're in, you have to take your craft seriously and know mm -hmm. know your craft because that's going to make the organization better. You're going to be able to get better resources for your organization because you're going to say, hey, sir, no, we can't do that. You can't come back two days later. Hey, let me research this. And in, in some cases, you may have to this a detailed mm -hmm. problem. But for the most part, you should be able to answer answer those, those questions because that's part of your preparation on on being a leader. 
I got you. Well, so we got a comment coming in. Let's go ahead and throw that comment on the on the on the page. It says, "Too many officers think that they have arrived and do not understand that each promotion brings with it the requirement and need to prepare for the known and unknown. No one cares that you are new." Hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, now that's a great uh, that's that's a great comment. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think so, because folks arrive as, hey, I'm a I'm a commander now. Uh, I'm a you know, and and really we've come full circle. So I'm going to take it back a little bit. You know, uh, I first took command in Operation Iraqi Freedom in OIF-1. Mm -hmm. Well, back then what happened was you actually had to certify. You had to do all of these tasks and then you had to go sit with the brigade commander who who basically quiz you on those before you could even go lead an organization. You mm -hmm. had to prove your competency before you even arrived. And I'll tell you, when I arrived as a, as a young captain and we were doing operations at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, I'll tell you, my NCOs were so experienced that I had to learn from them, but I did show up and prepared. And in every job that I've went to, uh, I've taken the time before arriving, I think a couple key things. One, the intangible, if you're going to be in, in the, the military profession, you got to show up physically fit because it's just a it's a discriminator before you arrive. Mm -hmm. Two, you've got to show competence in how you speak, how you speak, act, and carry yourself uh, as an officer. And that's in any or even curtain before you get there. What are they doing next? How do I prepare to be value added? before, you know, when I get there. Uh, and I'll tell you, in each experience, as a major, I left CGSC on the 17th. Three days later, driving across the country, I was a battalion S3 preparing for a, a major operation to, to deploy the battalion to Yakima. There was no learning curve. The first day, what happened? Battalion XO took me out of five mile run with the staff. I could have, I could have fell out mm -hmm. I, I, you know how many people would have wanted to follow me and then second i had to show my ability to plan four days later i had a brief with the brigade commander uh basically to describe how we're going to get there deploy and all those things so mm -hmm. so that's just an example but part of it is hey i knew going in hey i had to have i had to understand the orders process understand my craft and then i had to be personally and professionally ready uh when i arrived so great 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 point Okay, let's jump into the next one. Agile and adaptive. <laughs> right. Oh. <laughs> yeah, uh, some call it a buzzword. You know, if you look in the doctrine for mission command, uh, it does say, uh, how does it say? It says, uh, you know, enable discipline, initiative within the commander's intent, empower agile and adaptive leaders in the conduct mm -hmm. of unified land operations, right? So what mm -hmm. is all that? What is all that? And, and here's here's how I'll describe describe it. I think this is the hardest thing that any leader does is your legacy is built around you know my you know my and my command philosophy. I had one thing and I remember it to this day probably the rest of my life. Train and mentor the next generation of leaders, mm -hmm. right? And so if you're training and mentor the next generation of leaders, how do you do that? And I think part of it is if you have a craft, uh, a, a specialty, is you're building confidence through repetition. So whether you're going to combat, whether you're doing training or you're doing something, it shouldn't be the first time, you know, when you're doing something for real, it shouldn't be the first time that these leaders have ever saw that. So you've got to do that and you've got to know who your, who, who your training audience is. So if I'm building the next generation of leaders, I've got to start at the lower level. I've got to start with my platoon leaders, my junior executives, and I've got to make sure that, hey, I'm training you to do my job. Mm -hmm. You need and to to empower and to really have discipline initiative, they need to know how I think. They need to know, hey, here's what I value. And I can do that through structuring training a certain way and, and spending time uh, with them to, to ensure that, you know, it's not just about the actions we do, it's about mm -hmm. how you solve problems. Because what you're gonna find, you know, we said a complex world, I've seen some of the most com complex uh, situations in combat, you know, where I immediately got five leaders on the phone and I've got four different 
the situations going on in Afghanistan. And I'll tell you, you know, those people that depend on that, you know how they think, they know how you think. And you mm -hmm. just say, hey, this is what I need you to do. This is the mission I need you to accomplish. I'm not going to tell you, I need you to go to this block, turn left, do this. Mm -hmm. I'm basically giving them that mission command type order and saying, hey, hey, man, look, go to the hospital, find the American that's in there and bring him home at all costs. Do you understand my intent? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir, I do. Okay. You know, and being able to have that relationship with their and, and that takes that takes time. But replicating the challenges that leaders will face in combat or training is important. And then something that we've already mentioned is the preparation to be able to do that. And so um, part of that preparation is, you know, we have a lot of standard. I'm sure in every organization there's these standard training events. We're going to go do this. We're going to do ethics training. We're going to mm -hmm. do EO training. But you really have to look at when you have these events, don't waste people's time. How do you improve yeah. it? You shouldn't be doing anything that's just, I'm going to show up and I'm going to shoot 24 on my weapon and we're going to call it good and we're going to mark our stats and say we're good. You should be challenging your organization to be better. And, and I think how you mm -hmm. how you do that is, you know, is, is taking the time before any event. You have to take the time to, uh, you know, to to prepare and then give back briefs to the senior leaders so they have buy in. Hey, nope. Hey, I want this change. This is the this is the objective that I'm trying to reach in this training event. And too many leaders, they just show up. Oh, training. Well, this sucks. Well, hey, well, where were you at in the the 60 day out brief or the 30 day out to give your guidance of how you wanted this to occur? And so I think that that's just important. And we'll and we'll come back to this. Uh, there, because I think uh, the time you spend training your your leaders is the most in, important. Okay, let's jump into the next. Okay, so, scenario based uh, training. So what is, what does all this mean? You know, discipline initiative type exercises uh, things. So we talked about starting with the basics. Once you have the basics and the fundamentals, and really I wanted to touch on one thing on that, what are the tasks that an organization does on a routine basis? You know, if you're in the Army or you're in the Marines, uh, some places have top five, medical, marksmanship, PT. Uh, I would be offended if the commander had to tell me, hey, Jackson, go get, go get your five people qualified. Go go raise your, your you know, your, uh, your non-availability percentage in the military. Uh, people that had to go to the doctor, had to go to get shots. I would be offended because as leaders, we should manage the basics at every level. So at the captain level, as a, you know, company commander, as a junior leader, uh, do that. And so one thing I think that's, that's missing as you talk about our leaders is, if you were if you were a senior executive or mid-level battalion commander or field grade, how do you get feedback from your junior leaders? So mm -hmm. a lot of the times we have you're you're seeing your company commanders and battery commanders quite often, but how do you really get a pulse on what's going on? In my experience, is uh, you know you really have to talk to them. So you have to establish a a rhythm where you do that. My technique was uh, I did what you call platoon readiness briefings. So, for instance, uh, every quarter I met with every me and the sergeant major met with every platoon leader, platoon sergeants. I wanted to hear directly, hey, how are you? How are you doing the basics? Talk to me about the five basics. You know, it really was training, manning and equipping. So they mm -hmm. talked to me about those things. And I tell you, I learned more about my organization by having those than any other form, because when you get a, a you know, a, a, a platoon sergeant, they're going to speak their mind. You're going to learn the problems and then you're able to take action. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when you talk about, you know, mutual trust, I think, you know, mutual trust. Well, if, if Otis, if you came and told me, hey, we have this problem, we can't get this solved. And then I said, oh, really? Well, I didn't know about that. Well, what I would always do is the follow up. So I would go back a couple weeks later and said, hey, I talked to XO, we fixed this problem. Hey, is it fixed? Sir, it's fixed. Now they feel like, hey, they can talk to me. They trust that, hey, I'm going to take action. And it, it kind of creates and strengthens the bond and the relationship, too, with your with your junior leaders, uh, you know, as you as you do that. 
Um, isn't that part of then, empowering? Isn't that part of empowering your leadership? Uh, you've got to have that developed ab- relationship with them prior, though. A- a- absolutely, absolutely, mm-hmm. empowerment. And so, and I, and that's one thing I always struggle to. Always wanted to feel like, hey, what are the ways that you can empower? So uh, access to things. Hey. Well, only, you know, if you look at some jobs, you know, I work in OSD now, so mainly a civilian organization, uh, you know, probably about four military out of 50 in our office, for instance. And so, well, if it's a certain task, but only the directors can do that. Uh, and you see it in the Army. So in the Army example is, well, only the first sergeant has access to med pros or to these systems. No, that's not going to work. Who do mm-hmm. I need to call? Because how can you fix problems if you don't have access to the systems? Yeah. So. For, you know, so platoon sergeants, platoon leaders need access to manage their organization. You need to be able to make sure that everybody has access to all the tools that they need to, like you said, empowering them to have all the tools necessary to, to accomplish their mission the best way they can. Okay, let's jump into the next one, sir. Okay, um, so how do you ingrain the basics in the culture? That's really kind of what I wanted to get uh, get to after the out of this. So a part of I think in, in, is uh, I took more of a holistic approach. And what I mean by that is I always looked at it in a way I was brought up was I looked at it at, at the whole year. So I was going to make an annual training plan that laid out, hey, here's where I want to be at the end of 2020. And then all the basics were incorporated into that along the way. So there was no doubt uh there and then one other thing to this is uh intent right you talk about leaders and what is your intent well weekly uh so in the army we have training schedules right you have you know D- dtms so mm-hmm. weekly i basically did a you know here are the three or four tasks that i want our organization to accomplish and then here's the end state the end state says hey no matter what here's where i want your organization to be at the end of the week so everybody knew hey here's where we're going to be here's here are the things that i have to accomplish mm-hmm. and, and then it, and then it comes down to the the personal pride where hey these are the basics the boss you know by the end of this period he want you know we have to be qualified in all of these skills it's a given but i'm basically giving them timeline what i'm not doing is i'm not telling them hey how are you going to do this hey how are you going to do pt well when are you going to do that i'm allowing those those commanders those battery and company the troop commanders and say, hey, mm-hmm. sir, they would back brief me in their training brief and say, hey, here's what I'm doing to do X. Here's what I'm doing to do Y. And so they felt empowered because, I, you know, I'm not micromanaging, but I'm giving you the intent. I want you to be done with these skills by X date. And, mm-hmm. and you know, how you get there is, is on you. And trusting the leadership, let them do the hard work. Let them do the work that makes them feel like they own, <laughs> own their destiny. That is excellent point. Let's jump into the next. Uh, yeah. So, so you know, mission orders. Um, how do you how do you do that? And what are the what are the techniques? And so, uh, I feel like in our organization, the Army, for instance, you know, we really got away from, you know, mission orders. And we really got away from orders, period. Yeah. We got into patrol briefs where we're going to give a quick patrol brief. We're moving out, doing this, respect contact. You know, we got into those things, but we really got into the essence. Growing up as a young lieutenant and doing exercises, we always made plans. We always gave an order. We, we were a lot more lockstep uh, in our culture. And so how do you bring back the fundamentals of the organization? Because if you what I what I found over time uh, is that when you go through those things and you make them part of the culture, you know, so for instance, hey, if we're going to do something six weeks out, a plan must be published. Mm -hmm. And in that plan, you must have laid out when is the back brief to me? Hey, when are we doing the rock drill? When are we going to do the rehearsal? Hey, and then all 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 a, a leader has to do is say, hey. Hey, when, are, when is your battery rehearsal? Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attend. When you say that, what did you just do? I didn't tell you, you must do it back. But I said, hey, I'm going to be there when you do your back brief. And so I found that was just phenomenal because not only, not only in the mission command aspect, but I was able to look at a lot of talent and how leaders were preparing their organization because I was seeing how they lead, just sitting in the back of the room, 
while they gave instructions on how this mission was going to go. You know, and in combat situations, I would go out with with young leaders while they executed their mission and see them as part of battlefield circulation. And, and I think that it's really important to give, you know, the overall intent, why you're doing it, give mission type orders and let young leaders execute. Yes. If you've done all the things that we discussed before, you're comfortable with who you, you know, who you have in position and, and how they're going to perform. Tracking. Let's jump into the next. I just talked about, um, you know, what's your role as a, as a mid grade leader or field grade battery commander, uh, officer in the three shop, uh, what, what's your role in that? So part of it, when people talk about mission command, people only think the battalion commander owns mission command, the brigade commander. No, you as a mid grade leader, as a field grade officer, as a senior captain, you have a role in this as well in helping the commander manage these processes. So once I, you know, once I go into an organization, I basically set, as we talked about last time, hey, here's the standard. Here's the standard for everything we do. Here's what the, my expectations are. And then, hey, weekly now, the, the, the junior officer can come in out of the three shop. They're going to draft my, my training guidance for the week, my intent. I'm going to fine tune it, but there's some teaching in there. And so if you're going to teach your young leaders, so I think this whole process of, like we talk about here, publishing op orders, key events, you know, publishing a, a plan at a, at a company of, it's important because not only is it just about making sure things are executed correctly, back to my very first point, you're training and mentoring the next generation of leaders. And so you infuse that. What do you think the first thing they're going to do when they go to their new, new organization? They're going to say, Oh man, what? We don't have a plan. We should have this. You know what I mean? You're, mm -hmm. you've infused the culture so much that they've learned and they're going to adopt that and, and carry that with them the rest, the, the rest of their career. And then that's when you can, you know, when it gets on autopilot as a commander, then I just sit back and smile. I said, okay, we are, you know, we are really on it. We're, we're doing the things the right way. And, and so uh, that always, that always warmed my heart when I, when I saw that just start that, that happen without, you know, any intervention. I, that's a great, great thing. Excellent. Excellent. Let's jump into the next. All right. Current, the current state of affairs around the world. Um, and I'm going to talk about this a little later, but um, I, I feel like we weren't reading as much. You know, we we weren't staying, yeah. you know, glued to what's going on in the world uh, and, and what that really means. And so I think w when you look at the army and you look at some of the places we're going, there's a lot of historical context or Afghanistan, Iraq. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to know where we've been in the past to, I think, have success and what are some of the implications? So um, I struggle with this because I saw it, uh, you know, when I was in Afghanistan, for instance, uh, the, you know, we worked with a lot of, uh, we were part of a task force and one battalion was British and the other battalion was, was you know, US battalion, our battalion under a British one star. So they commanded at a much senior level. So their company mm -hmm. level commanders are majors, but, when I started to talk and invest in them, I saw that they were so glued in and I'm looking at my lieutenants, you know, who are, who are platoon leaders, their platoon leaders are captains. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I was just shocked. And so, uh, I wanted to start an initiative to start to, you know, really, uh, understand, well, why is this event happening at the, uh, why, why are we having so much, so many problems at, uh, the, the Pakistan or the, the Indian embassy? Well, why did you know? And we think that these terror group came from Pakistan. Well, find out. Hey, none of my, none of my lieutenants knew anything about the, the you know, previous conflicts with India and Pakistan. Yeah. You know, I mean, but but it was having real, it was having real world implications on mm -hmm. what we were doing. And so that was probably one of the times I looked. I said, man, I've got to, you know, I've got to, I've got to look back, you know. I got to look back. I've got to fix this problem. I've got to kind of close the gap. And so one way, mm -hmm. one way I did it, and I think you could do this in Garrison too, is uh, I started having, I call them strategic, strategic dinners, you know, we're deployed. <laughs> so uh, I picked a topic on a major country every, every month. 
And basically, I would sit around and I would have one lieutenant lead the discussion. So they had to do all the preparation. They had to come see me, kind of give me a back brief. And then we then we would have a pick a date where we would go have dinner. And, and that unit, you know, those leaders in that organization, we would talk about and we would bring questions. And we and, and so I, I tried to do that with each organization. You know, we had five organizations. Uh, I tried to do that with each organization once a month to really level the bubbles. And then not only for the current fight, but for the future you know, to really broaden our, our, our perspective. Uh, and so that was one way that uh, I tried to get, I tried to get around it because you, you don't know, you know, what's next and how do you prepare? So if you look at, you know, the current day and some of my friends who are, you know, brigade commanders now is, uh, you know, COVID. Well, a lot of units got warning orders. They were going to deploy and do this. And so you and that organization as a captain, a Looks like we got a little bit of an audio issue going on. Let's bring him back. Hey, sir. We may have a we may have a little bit of an audio visual disconnect right now. Hey, sir. I know. Um, okay. I, we had a little bit of a, of a delay. The <laughs> last the last thing I personally heard was when you were talking about um, failing to prepare. And that's the last that I heard. So okay. if you want to come back from there, let's go at it again. Okay. Yeah. So how do you prepare for the unknown? And mm -hmm. I think it starts with what I've, I've said before: is hey, you have the basics as a, you know, as a, as a foundation. Uh, that's why that's so important. And then what are the, you know, I think the leaders. You're always going to have these multitude of tasks. Uh oh, oh man! Looks like we're still having a little bit of a disconnection going on with the video. All these things out there. Okay, I think we're back. Yeah, I, th I think I think we're having a little bit of an issue, sir, with the uh, the video and the um, the connectivity. What I would recommend. So, how about this, sir? Since we've got about we've got about twenty one slides of information. Um, I think, I think we can kind of just jump through them a little bit faster. This presentation will still be available. Yeah, go to um, it will be available for those who want a copy of it. And we, I'll, of course, um, if they want to contact you, I'm sure they can connect with you on global as well. Okay. Go to slide 15 for me, Otis. Too easy. I got you. Here we go. Okay. So this was uh, my Sergeant Major's favorite saying, you know, leadership versus likership. So what does that mean in an organization? And, and, and what I'll tell you is uh, leadership, as you continue to progress in leadership, is sometimes very lonely. Uh, I've got a couple examples uh, that I wanted to share. Uh, when I was a major, I went up, I was going to be the Brigade 3. I wanted to basically change the whole way we did orders so that we did, you know, weekly orders and we weren't doing these little bit of information today, a little bit of information tomorrow. I wanted to be able to be, give a better product. For me coming on board, everybody hated. I get to the, you know, I'm deployed. I'm in Iraq. It's 09, 10, and nobody talked to me for the first couple of weeks. This guy's crazy, and I ate, ate dinner by myself every day. But after a while, the positive feedback that came from the battalion commanders in there, uh, it, it, you know, it, it wind up, you know, working out and, uh, it, it, you know, but you can't be phased with, uh, you know, pushback. You have to listen, you know, take inputs, make changes, but don't be afraid because you don't need people to like you. You need, you need to do what's best for your organization. Uh, an another example, uh, organizing for deployment. So, you know, a lot of times as you're, you know, you're getting ready to go do this certain thing or mission, you know, there's these restrictions on numbers um, to take, you know, the best unit for it, even if that meant not taking my whole organization and me, the sergeant major, it was lonely. Um, and because everybody's like, well, sir, we've got to be parochial. We can only take our people and, 
And no, you always have to do what is right uh, for the organization. Even if that means that people are going to be mad with you, mm -hmm. uh, you always must do, you know, the right thing. And, uh, and decisions, you know, we don't talk about decision making a lot. You know, we just want to lead and give orders. But I'll tell you, uh, some of the best things, I, some of the best things that's happened in my career or saved lives were decisions that where I was on an island where nobody, nobody else was with me. Because one thing that I think I've learned and sometimes the hard way is that the more experience you get, you're going to find that you're going to see and have a vision and see things that maybe nobody else in there is going to see. And that's really what the army is paying you to do as you become mm -hmm. a field grade officer, uh, major, or you become a battalion commander. It's, it's having that vision. Uh, there's a book out there. Um, many people probably read called team of teams and it talks about, um, what is it? It talks about, um, efficiency versus effectiveness. So I got counsel one day by the brigade commander, you know, I'm in deployed. He's talking to me. I gave him a mission brief. He's like, wow, man, you're doing a lot of missions. You're doing like a lot of missions. And he said, hey, I want you to think about one thing. I want you to go back and read this, this section here in Team of Teams. It's effectiveness versus efficiency. What are the indicators when you're doing too much? What, you know, how do you <laughs> yeah. do that? How do you pull back? How do you say no, even when things are going well? Because only you are going to be able to, you know, do that and have that pulse on you know what's uh what's going on and so i think i think that's important that hey, in leadership you know everybody's not going to like every decision every decision you make you're never going to have 100 percent concurrence and so you have to be able to push through that all right go to the next slide for me got you sir okay and then really there you go and and really this slide i'm going to talk really about the next three slides uh in my comments and so uh, this one talks about selection. Uh, so we talk about selecting leaders, uh, selecting people that you accomplish a mission and then leaders of character, competence and commitment. Um, there's a lot of discussions in this community uh, that we've had that's been in the on the website that have talked about. Um, I want a fair shot. Most leaders make their mind up in the first 90 days. By the time I've learned your name, it's probably for a reason. And most leaders don't change their mind that hard to come back and so part of that what we've done you've got to come in prepared because i'm not changing my mind because you're sitting here and you don't like the oer and this and that uh and so i i think that that's important uh because it's about you know we talk about mutual trust empowerment and those things um I select people for me. I personally, and I know most of the people that I know, I select people based on trust. It doesn't matter what position you're in. Uh, you're, you should be leading this operation, leading this task. Mm -hmm. I always, when it came down to crunch time and crises, I didn't care what this person was doing. I want Otis now. I want a face to face with him. If it's life or death, I'm always going to pick the best people. So your job is really to be the best person, hey, to, to have the leader in that organization have, you know, have trust in you that you're going to be the one that that's that's called upon, uh, because I, I just think that that's really, really important, because when it comes down to evaluation time, it, it's too late to fight in, yeah. you know, no, you know, I've never I, I have 52 officers that I, I senior rated. I never once changed my mind. Most of my peers never change their mind. All your fighting is doing done by your actions. So make sure you understand the expectations up front, which was our first slide. Make sure you understand the priorities of your boss, your boss's boss, and leader organization. And then when it comes down time to eat at OER time at the end of the reporting period, mm -hmm. you know, you won't you won't have any problems because you have been executing with an intent and, and you will be you know will be be fine. And then uh, and the last thing I'll say about those slides is um, continue to understand and, and, and find the, the, the people in your organization that can give you feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of there's been a lot of discussions on there about, well, the boss didn't talk to me. But, hey, you have the XO, you have the S3, you have the sergeant, mate, you have all these people in these organizations who can give you feedback. Trust me, they know exactly how the boss thinks about you. Right. And so you have to be able to listen and then you have to be able to uh, change what what always 
what always really I appreciated was when you look over a couple year period and say you're senior rating officers. When I in the first year, maybe I didn't take care of this guy. He didn't get a, a most qualified. But mm-hmm. I gave him pretty hey, these are the ta- these are the things you should be doing if you want to be there. It warmed my heart when they were able to receive that criticism and then take it and fix it with tangible actions in the next year. I always came back with my word. You did exactly what I asked you, what I what I what I thought you were missing. And and then they were, you know, and, and, and so I just think that you can grow. You know, you may not always be, and I think Colonel Wagner always did a good job of saying, hey, I learned from this. My boss told me I wasn't that good. Uh, we've all gotten feedback that we don't like, and you have to really be able to receive that feedback. And then don't take it personal. Hey, just just change the things that you receive uh, feedback on. Mm-hmm. Uh, go to slide 20 for me, Otis. I got you. Okay. And these uh, last last thing that I'll really talk about and open it up is really, uh, you know, risk. How do you how do you manage risk in an organization? And I, I'll tell you, for most of my career, I was probably like many people, I just blew that off. I blew it off. Hey, risk management, hey, make sure we have it when we go to this operation. Make sure we go to range that somebody signed this. I'll tell you, when I got to Fort Drum, it made me respect risk management on a whole nother level mm-hmm. because it was it was life or death. We were out, it was negative 20 degrees and and and, and I had to continuously uh, apply risk management to to change to hey go to this next level go to this next level clothing go to this and so it really made me uh, respect that uh, and then the field grade officer the mid level leader has a responsibility in that you think the person doing the operation and the commander is the only one no no you as the mid grade leader have a responsibility so one quick story. I was I was a battalion XO at a time. Uh, we were in Yakima Training Center. The battalion was preparing to deploy to Iraq, um, and we had a new battalion commander, probably about a couple weeks. And he just wanted to go hard. He wanted to do these 72 hours. Nobody was sleeping. We had just signed for 80 trucks, <laughs> and me, I'm the I'm the XO. One thing is, hey, my, one of my one person told me, hey. Never be afraid to tell the truth and never be afraid to speak and have your voice heard. And so no sleep for sleep. Uh, the third day. Hey, sir. Uh, I think there was a. Sh- uh, go ahead. So we had a severe break in the audio then. I think you were you were bringing some points that people would have loved. So if you can go back to, you said, uh, the last thing that I've heard personally was um, your battalion commander coming in and wanted to go hard 72 hours without sleep. And that's when the audio kind of got a little choppy. Okay. So let's let's get back to that point again, yeah. if you can okay. bring it back for us again. Okay. Um, so new battalion commander on board, we're training for a mission. Uh, we have super developed plan, 72 hours, no students, a few things. Uh, I saw the indicators. I'm a battalion XO. I'm not the commander. Uh, but things start happening. You know, there's indicators out there. Uh, we had a dry blank mix up at a range where they shot a lot down at the blank range. We had a accident, uh, people coming in because they fell asleep. Mm-hmm. And I think the third thing was we had a... Um, we had a round discharge in the barracks or something. It was a it was a blank round, but we still we had like three incidents. So me, I'm looking at I'm the XO. I'm looking at the battalion. You know, we had about 500 people, mm-hmm. and so I go I call the boss, and I said, Sir, we've got to stop. We've got to slow it down. You know what the battalion commander responded with? What was the response? I'm a battalion commander. Anything happened 24 hours later? We got gone. <laughs> we had a <laughs> right. We had a major rollover. Put three soldiers in a hospital. Almost killed. 
So what? So I saw it. I spoke up. I called the battalion commander, sir. Just get to the hot, sir. Don't need to apologize to me now. Just get to me to see the soldiers. And so, what my point to all that is: you as a field grade, you as an A3, a captain, you have a responsibility to call a spade a spade when you see it. So, yeah. risk management is not just the leader; it's everybody in that organization. Hey, sir, it's ten below. We probably need these level glow, we probably need X, Y, and Z. And so just having that fortitude to speak up. Mm -hmm. Commanders may not always listen, but you need to be able to do that to protect your people, save lives, and, mm -hmm. and making sure you're doing the right thing for the for the organi organization. Good stuff. Okay, go to the next stuff. slide. Got you, sir. So as we talked about a lot of lot of things today. Um, and as you become a leader in whether it's a civilian organization or in the army, Marines, it doesn't matter. Uh, you're going to build a level of judgment. You know, for me, judgment and your character are always the most important for any leader. So, you know, if I look at my five deployments, uh, and I look at, you know, leading in combat three times as a senior leader. I never let a never let a patrol go out without an officer for one reason, judgment. I, I knew the judgment of the people that I had invested time and spent time with, how they thought, how they would exercise this initiative. Mm -hmm. And so the judgment for a leader is the most important thing. Will you do the right thing? Will you not let, uh, you know, ethics violations, uh, you know, good order and discipline uh, violation of, of human rights where well, you you mm -hmm. can't let those things happen and so it's important that you understand that and you prevent that and you have the judgment to, to and, and and fortitude to speak up when yeah. required uh, to be able to prevent those type of bad things that you know that happen especially in high stress uh, situations and then as the you know so you empower and make sure you have the right people that you trust because you trust their judgment as a leader so as a senior leader you're putting the people in these positions because you trust them, mm -hmm. right? And then you under, you're you underwriting the risk. So commander bears a burden, you know, and uh, and I'll tell you, I mean, it's a heavy burden at times because people think, oh, I mean, commander's doing that. He's not, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, every night, for instance, in one example, you know, when I was in Afghanistan, hey, the commander could only approve mission briefs. So every day I had to look at, man, I'm sending 20 people, 20 with two missions out a day and I'm looking at all these, man, am I, should I not see people here? Get hurt, this just happened. I walked the car before I went to bed. I wouldn't be able to live with myself if, if something happened. And what if I saw something at night that looked off, you know, but hey, last thing I did, To go and make sure that, that we're okay so there's a to embrace it to make sure that hey as a leader you know and i think back to somebody's comment uh that said hey you think you've arrived no my burden is to make sure that i'm as a leader doing the best job i can you know for the organization mm -hmm. but that means my time my effort my energy uh i always say as a leader as a battalion commander you belong to the organization you've got my whole effort my whole energy, uh, and I, I think that's important because if you're going to be a good leader, then you must give your all and, uh, and you must bear that burden to make sure that everything's being done uh, for your organization. All right. Sir, these were excellent slides. Let's kind of get into the uh, Q&A portion of our discussion. Okay. So let's bring it right here. And we apologize about the, the audiovisual uh, you know, break up sometimes, but we're, we're trying our best here. Uh, you're going to have, you know, I am going to, I've already, if you look on the bottom of the screen, it says, hey, if you want a copy of this presentation, just shoot me an email. I'll put it in Google Drive and send you all 21 of those pictures. And you can, of course, I'm sure, reach out to Colonel Jackson, and I'm sure he would work with you. Uh, so we've got, a, we've got a, a good amount of questions, so let's go into it. First question that comes up, sir, how did you transition your leadership style from the military into the civilian force? 
<laughs> great, great question. It was tough, I'll tell you. Uh, so my first experience really was I worked on the joint staff uh, for the last two years, and it was mostly military. This last summer in June, first of all, I showed up at 6.30 and nobody was there. Um, and so I think how I transitioned was really getting a better understanding of the civilian workforce. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't, I, I personally don't, you know, we spend so much time in these division level organizations. Uh, and so I had to basically, when I, the first exposure for me was actually being at the War College when I left Battalion Command. And I said, you know, I looked to my right and I said, wow, we've got some really talented civilian workforce. And so it was, it was almost gaining a new respect because I just hadn't been exposed to it. And then now in my current job, after I arrived this summer, I'll tell you, um, I mean, I work every day. I mean, you, you saw me right before I got on this call, my civilian boss called me, yeah. and, you know, we're working stuff on NATO and stuff. And so uh, I think for the military folks, what I'll tell you is above the tactical level, there are hundreds or thousands of of civilians out there uh, just working for your your benefit. And I'll tell you, they are, I mean, I've got, I mean, in my office, I'll tell you, I have some of the born fellows, Georgetown. I mean, I have some of the most talented workforce and it, and it makes me step my game up. I'll tell mm -hmm. you, because they're great writers. They're great thinkers. They're, uh, we've got to do a better job of introducing that earlier in officers' careers, uh, mm -hmm. because I, I think, I think the civilian workforce is, is and, a, and a true asset. Um, and, and one last comment on that real quick is when I was at uh, HRC, I was a, I became a distribution manager the second year after being a assignment officer. And I had all these civilians. What I realized, too, is for the large organizations, the civilian workforce provides continuity. And so when you have a, a stud civilian who he or she is doing great things, it's actually better for the organization to put them in the hardest, the complex jobs because it'll provide continuity uh, for the organization. It took me about six months, six months of beating my head against the wall to really realize that and make drastic change. Mm -hmm. uh, because for the good of the organization, I think the civilian workforce is phenomenal in providing that continuity uh, of operations. Hey, shout out to my uh, co-civilian workers. We are the continuity of knowledge. So <laughs> yeah. shout out to us. Uh, let's jump into another question. It says, sir, as you progressed in rank and responsibility, how did you give your young leaders and commanders freedom to make decisions, juxtaposed to leaders who prefer to micromanage or deeply embedded in the weeds? Yeah, I think, I think this is uh, hard. Uh, I think it's hard for, for leaders uh, because some, you know, and not my position, but some folks, uh, when they look at it, they're worried about failure. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think part of it is you have to train your young leaders. And so how did, how did I do it as I progressed in rank and responsibility? Um, I, I took the approach as a battalion commander. I can tell you how I did it. And I'll talk about how I did it as a, as a battery commander. As a battalion commander, I spent a lot of time with my lieutenants. So I, I focused my my efforts on making sure that I didn't need to micromanage them because I understood where they were going. So mm -hmm. I talked about the tune readiness briefings earlier. I could sit in three, I could sit in the same unit and listen to three different platoon leaders. I knew which one was executing within intent and minutes. And so I think as you talk and give, provide feedback, and there's different ways of doing that. It's not just a training or not just a session. I did, I tried to do um, I tried to do PT, for instance, every morning with a different platoon leader so that I could just spend time with them so I could understand, you know, their decisions. And so I think leaders, uh, you know, leaders have to do a couple of things right. They've got to set clear expectations. And we talked about that where that's weekly. Uh, you set the expectations and the climate of the organization important where your young leaders can feel, you know, if you don't know the name of your lieutenants, if you don't know the name of their wives. Uh, and so but what it takes to get there is. You have to do a lot of things um, to set those conditions. Mm -hmm. So you have to do social events, uh, social events. You have to really, you know, PT, fun events, all those things so that people know who you are. So they're comfortable. Uh, and then you're learning them as well. So it's kind of a give and take situation from the leader to the lead. And so 
once people know who you are, uh, I think it, it, it leads to not a lot of mismanagement or micromanaging uh, because you just set your expectations and either you're meeting meeting the expectations or, or you're, you're not. not. And if yep. you're not, we, you're right, right. And so I think the, the, if you can give clear expectations, um, I, I think it really helps everybody and it's a win-win uh, for, the, for the organization. I hope I answered that question. I think you did. Let's jump into the next question. It says, would love to hear Colonel Jackson expound on mentorship versus sponsorship. Man, this is, uh, to me, mentorship is the most important thing, I would say, in my life or in my in my career. I feel that, you know, getting promoted to a colonel, the best thing I can do is, is, is mentor. And, and so I talk, if you really know me, I talk to people all the time, mm-hmm. uh, every day. I'm talking to people around the Army, white, black, male, female, everything. And so mentorship versus sponsorship. Let's talk the piece first, and we'll come back to mentorship. The sponsorship piece is you're going to see uh, they're you know they work for the same boss three or four times. Uh, they go there, and like some people see when they arrive, they not they. I feel like sometimes it you know people they may not have to work as hard as the next person because they their qualities are already known though too. So they know when they when I you know I, I have a saying too. I say hey, well if I, I invite you to the table, I mean if I invite you to the unit. You're gonna eat, right? I'm not gonna invite you to my house for dinner and not feed you if mm-hmm. I if I call you to the table. And so I think a lot of the sponsorship pieces, you know, there. Uh, I think for me and for a lot of people, you know, you may have ten. I've had like seven different senior raiders by the time I I, I progressed from being promoted to major to lieutenant colonel. And so uh, I think you gotta have not just one mentor i actually think you have to have several mentors because you may have a mentor where you're getting one piece out of it so for me personally i have one guy you know he's he's like my spiritual mentor i know if i talk to him i can talk about all this great stuff i'm doing the army the joint staff and osd and then he's gonna say then he's gonna stop and say hey kevin how's your relationship with god you know we're gonna have that or he's gonna send me the three minute prayer book uh, mm-hmm. And then I have uh, I, I have three mentors really, uh, two are white and one's black, right? And and what I'll tell you is I get something from each one of, one of them, and I think it's important that you can bounce ideas off of. Uh, I think there's a lot of rumors out there sometimes, uh, and then we always don't want to hear the truth. We want to we just want our what we want to do. We just want to confirm sometimes. Yeah, hey, I want to go do this. I want to go to this assignment. I want that. And so we're going to call somebody to have that confirmation. But a real mentor is never going to tell you what you want to hear. They're going to maybe at times tell you exactly what you don't want to hear, but it's for the greater good. And so I think being a good mentor, there's a couple of things that tell you. A mentor has to pick up the phone. You've got to pick up the phone. you got to respond to emails, texts. You're getting calls in the middle of the night. And so I think having that right person and mentor is important. Because you, everybody out there needs some guidance. I need guidance. I, I just talked to my mentor two days ago, uh, you know, and he said, well, what are you doing next? Well, what are you doing? What are you thinking about this? What, you know, mm-hmm. uh, I, I was out at Fort Leavenworth uh, in February promoting a couple of majors. I sat down with my man. I went to dinner with my first boss in the Army. Uh, and what did he do? Pull it out of a piece of paper. Kevin, you need to be doing this, man. You need to be getting ready for this, this, and this. And so I think mentorship is absolutely important. Get somebody you trust. They don't have to look like you, uh, but get somebody where you can have an open and honest dialogue, and you know that they're giving you advice uh, based on the good of their heart and that they, they want you to win. And everybody that, I, you know, and I'll tell you, there's one other thing about mentorship. Mentorship has paid off for me and all the guys that I have actually with tours, it's probably been 10 or 15 year relationships. Mm-hmm. It's probably a life, it's a lifelong relationship, really, is what it's turned into. And I'll tell you, they opened doors for me that were closed, shut. I probably, I wouldn't be a colonel today if it wasn't for my mentor. And I, you know, I won't get into details on here, but I, I'll just tell you, they did things for me that I couldn't do for myself. And so sometimes you, won't, you don't even know what the benefit is going to be. But, you know, for instance, uh, last week, one guy just graduated. They took their Sam's final last week. Uh, a guy down in Fort Worth gave me a call. He said, hey, sir, I'm going to so-and-so, so-and-so. I'm going to Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. You know what I did? 
I picked up the phone in Afghanistan and I called I called the chief of staff. Man, you're getting ready to get this stud just below the zone. The major is going to be awesome. So I may have just opened the door for this person. He don't know I made the call, right? There you and go. And so I think mentor, there's there's a lot of aspects of mentor mentorship. Uh, speaking about bringing... I get hyped up and, and passionate about the mentorship. <laughs> I got you, sir. I got you, sir. Talking about the light. Uh, did you want to take a, like a little break to maybe add on some light on you? Because... You're, you're looking, um, you're, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you the time to do that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I got you. I got you. So let me, in the meantime, let me bring up, uh, we got a few more questions. Uh, and then of course we'll go into some of the comments. Well, let's go into some of the comments. Let's go into some of the comments. We got a comment here. Uh, it says a Colonel who takes 90 days to judge is a fair colonel. There are others who will cement their view in 45 to 60 days. Your reputation arrives before you. Your peers talk about you. Help your teammates. What do you think about that comment, sir? So I've, I've, I've looked for probably the last couple years on the on the website and hear people talk about the OERs and stuff like that. I'll tell you that if you have a good adjutant, most people already know your paper before you arrive, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I pretty much knew every person was coming where they stood, but I wanted to give everybody a, a fair shot because I didn't care about I didn't care about what you've done in the past. It's all about what you do, you know, while you're here. And so I think part of this why is the 90 days so important? I think mm -hmm. the first step is I'm meeting everybody that comes to the organization. I'm not going to put you in a job mm -hmm. before I know what your capability is, because I might say, hey, you're going to stay in the headquarters and stay with me. So I, you know, normally I would do probably two hours where we would just go do PT, go lift some weights, go and cover mm -hmm. my run, talk or sit out there or go to an event together. Hey, I'm going to this social event. Hey, you're going to come with me. Mm -hmm. And so you have to really, I think, you know, uh, what's the book, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, Thin Slice. I think if I can sit down with you for a couple hours, know your family, know where you come from, uh, talk to you about kind of the principles, uh, then I feel like I can, I know enough to at least get you into a right job. And so I think it's important that a lot of leaders and somebody said, it kind of goes back to the other comment, sponsorship, who's sponsoring you to come to the organization, you being prepared when you show up. And then if you're a leader, a good leader, has a good orientation mm -hmm. to the organization. I want to know, make sure you got a place to live. You're not living in a hotel somewhere. I want to make sure that, you know, you're hanging with the right people. I want to make sure you're doing the right activities when off work so you don't go down those roads. Mm -hmm. And so I think sponsoring when you first get there, meeting the leader, spending that time with them up front. So from day one, when they go start their job, they already know the battalion commander. I've spent time with them. They already know what I think up front. And then I'm just going to continue to build that relationship. So I feel like I never felt like I rated some senior rated somebody that I didn't know them because I had spent a lot of time with them and the folks that weren't doing well, I wanted to spend more time with. Uh, gotcha. And so work hard, show up prepared and, 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 you know, and just leave it all out there uh, when it comes down to, you know, evaluations and stuff like that. Got you. We got a couple more comments. Uh, we got one from, hey, is this from Colonel Wagner? I believe so. It says a sponsor uses their platform and their reputation to move from uh, SM to the next developmental position. Okay. Appreciate it. We got another, this is like a jokey joke comment. He said, sir, quick joke. I'm 6'8", 270, so I may eat a lot at the table. Well, thank you very much, LeBron James, uh, joining the team. <laughs> we, we, we appreciate that. Uh, we got some, we got some uh, questions. We got a question that just came in. It said, uh, what are your thoughts on intro letters and emails? Do you like to receive them as a commander? Uh-oh, that face. What does that face mean, sir? I, I, I do. So I know uh, I, I'm torn. So I personally like receiving them for one reason, I think. I'll just be honest. Um, I thought it showed me how committed 
the officer was to the organization mm-hmm. and to the army because they were taking the time and they were so so to me it showed that they were vested in the organization and mm-hmm. so i personally like to receive them and so when i received them the first thing i would do is you know but then you know you you know I, i'm gonna look look at the orb or if they send it to me i'm gonna uh I may inquire, hey, does anybody know, was anybody in this OBC mm-hmm. or does anybody know so-and-so, so-and-so? Uh, but I personally like receiving them because I think it just shows the professionalism and that the officer is taking uh, the, the time. Uh, but the second, this, there's, a, there's also a flip side. Uh, not, they're not having anybody spell check them. They're not, you know, mm-hmm. if you're going to do it, make sure that you have or your senior leader, your mentor, you make sure you have somebody review them because mm-hmm. you don't, I've seen some, or I've, I've pre I've previewed some for folks I mentor. And you, you just have to make sure that too, that, that if that's the first correspondence that the commander has from you, you want to mm-hmm. make sure that, that it, it's the right correspondence. And so, uh, I, but I personally think it does when the commander reads them, he may not spend, he or she may not spend all the time, but it shows, you know, it does show your level of commitment and how vested you are in doing well and, uh, and you know, in the organization. I, that, that's just my personal thought on it. Okay. We got two more questions and then we'll call it a wrap. Of course, if you all want follow-ups, et cetera, you could always uh, send Colonel Jackson an email. I'm sure he would be welcome to those questions. So we got two more uh, questions. Absolutely. Uh, it says, sir, thank you for sharing with us. Uh, sir, I've heard uh, the statement on many occasions. It's lonely as leaders. Uh, I, as I've listened to senior leaders and SESs, how do you prepare yourself to be vulnerable and allow someone to walk alongside you uh, so that these moments of loneliness happen? Uh, there's someone there to hold you up. As in, so I'm thinking, okay, as you said earlier, it's lonely up on top. Leadership gets lonely. Your peers get lonely. So they're looking for um, how do you put yourself in a position where, I guess what they're asking is uh, it's lonely for us as leaders. How do you get uh, prepared for that sort of a situation? Yeah. And so there's multiple components to this question, but uh, I'm going to talk about a couple, uh, really a couple things. And so, um, you know, with, with the current, I'm going to talk about the OER. With the current OER, for instance, I think there's a lot of pressure for, you know, majors, captains uh, coming up. So I I think as African-American officers, we place, you know, we place even more pressure on ourselves because everything is, you know, I have to be MQ. uh, You know, I have to be number one of 30. I can't be number three. Uh, And so I think there's a lot of undue pressure that we put ourselves and don't allow ourselves to be vulnerable because we want to get to success. Uh, And I think the more my experience has been, the more people learn about the system, the worse it makes them because they start to really stress. And we're not doing this for we're not in this profession for the reports. Yes, everybody wants to eat when it's time to eat, but you want to make sure if you're doing the right things, uh, you know, doing the right things, operate within the commander's intent, uh, and, and you're having no success, that you're going to be, you know, going to be okay. And so I think some of the loneliness, I think it's spe- so I'll tell you, when I got to Fort Drum, I was one before Bernie arrived uh, a year later, I was one of 32, the only African American or minority. Uh, at Fort Drum as a battalion commander. I think the loneliness comes from you put, I had, I put undue pressure on myself. uh, And then back to, you know, Colonel Colonel Wagner's point, like some of those folks had previous relation to the boss who had put them in position. So I didn't know if the boss had worked with three of the seven battalion commanders in the brigade before. And so I'm worried that, Hey, maybe the, maybe the boss, boss already knew them. And so I think I put a lot of undue pressure on myself, which which created me to be lonely because I'm like, man, I've got to come. I got to do this. I got to keep pushing. And so I'm pushing, pushing, pushing uh, instead of taking it all in, being a little bit more more deliberate with things. And so I think that creates and then I feel like sometime as an African-American leader, especially as a tank commander, as a colonel, I felt like 
I just couldn't relate to certain certain people. I, I just didn't relate to a, as well, and so that made it a little bit hard. Of the seven commanders, hey, maybe, you know, I was cordial, and we, you know, all of them, I could talk, but who's the guy when or girl when things happen and and uh, well, they don't agree with the decision the brigade commander made? Who's calling you? Who's having that dialogue as peers with you? Mm-hmm. Like, who on the installation is having that dialogue with you? And so I think the loneliness comes from, you know, you. What if the phone doesn't ring? Or what if you you're cordial with them, but you don't have a lot in common? I felt like I didn't have a lot as common with some of my peers, and so I felt at times it made me kind of isolated. Like, hey, I know I, I think I'm doing okay. I just gotta keep marching. Well, what happens if 12 months later I'm going to the boss says, wait, man, you're not. Everybody else is doing this, and you're not doing this so you have to be comfortable um you know how do you hold yourself up i think is you come prepared and then i think at a point and for me it was probably my transition from major lieutenant colonel yeah. you've got to be comfortable that the army has put you in this position that you're supposed to be there and, and you have to stop worrying about what everybody else is doing and just perform you know, I'm not worried about this people doing. Hey, I'm listening. I'm taking I'm taking best practices. I'm reading everything everybody's doing. But at the end of the day, it's about I have to perform. And if if I'm lonely, you know, and so what happens when folks are lonely? I think what you have to make sure is that that doesn't lead you to some you know mischievous act. You got to make sure that you're always operating within the army values and leadership. Uh, you know, because just because you're lonely doesn't make any, any excuses. And so um, I think I, I've seen, you know, and I had a personal situation. Uh, I won't talk about it here with, you know, with feel great um, officer that, you know, they allow that to consume them, yeah. you know, to make friction. And so I think it, it's important that, you know, that yeah, you're going to have times where you feel like you're isolated, but you do have a platoon leader, platoon sergeant, you have a sergeant major, and then you have to find, you know, you know what I did. I think when I was at my low point, uh, I remember it was I was deployed, and uh, I called my mentor probably at twelve thirty at night. But it was so critical, and I was in such a bad place because I had some major decision I needed to make, and uh, and I called him at like twelve thirty at night, and probably talked to him for an hour and a half. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, I'm glad I called. So have that support network as well. Back to the mentorship is sometimes, you know, they've been in your position. They've they've done your job, and so it's okay to call for help too. It's okay to actually right. ask for help too. And so a lot of times we don't want to ask for help either. And so we've got to be comfortable uh, reaching out and you know and having that. Uh, and on the joint staff, I had peers, and in OSC, I have peers that I can reach out to, I can talk to, I can work with uh, as well. And so that that always helps. Okay. And we got a final question here. We're only limited in time because uh, daddy's got to handle business at home. So I excuse me, y'all. But, uh, you know, I do have a time limit here. So here we go. Final question for the day. It says, uh, sir, what attributions, different types of attributions do you look for? How do you build a diverse team? And, you know, this is an earlier, I think this is an earlier shout out to a point that you brought up where you said you had mentors, two white, one black. And I do want to, I want to follow up with, with uh, the point that you made with that. Um, I remember Colonel Wagner said, you know, mentorship should be multi-diverse, multi-racial, multi-ethnic, multi-gender. That's, that's good. That's ideal. But realistically, not everyone has that opportunity or feel comfortable based on their history for looking for that type of mentorship. But now I want to hear from you, sir, what exactly and how exactly do you develop that diverse team according to this question? Yeah, I I think, uh, you know, you I think when you look at a battalion commander or a brigade commander, you're looking for those uh, the attributes that you're really looking for. I always look for is how are they leading? And, and I'm going to take that a step further. What are the attributes they have? So are you arrogant? That's probably one of my, you know, my, what well, was one of my pet peeves. But do they love their soldiers and do what's right? Are they leading the way they should? Are they uh, 
and so I wanted I wanted people that cared about the organization that they were in it, you know, that they were in it for the army, and that they actually were doing things that it wasn't just. Hey, the battalion commander's around. I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. I wanted to make sure that the people were actually leading uh, and and you know and loving it. So it's a, it's a uh, a different statement, but that they were actually cared about the organization and and the people they led. So when you care about the people you lead and you really the action, your actions speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. So you're putting in policies. You're respecting people's time. On your, you know, I had it over. I was going to say, like, hey, the best thing you can do as a leader, too, is provide predictability in the lives of your families and, mm -hmm. and leaders. So I look, the attributions I'm looking for is people that, that, what are your, you know, what do your soldiers say about you? How do yeah. you lead? Do you care for your soldiers? Do you care for the organization? And then always looking for people that share across the team to make the whole organization better. Mm -hmm. I want people that can think and, and not just, Hey, I was told to do this. I'm just going to do that. I want people that have ideas that they can share to make the whole organization uh, better. And so I think building a diverse team too is uh, you have to you have to you have to really talk to people, uh, mm -hmm. you know. And so some leaders, you know, it, and it's a double-edged sword. You got to be accessible, but not too accessible. And so how do you balance that as a leader? Uh, my problem, I balance that. Sometimes not doing a good job, you know, because you want to connect with people. Uh, and, and so how do you do that so that you really know your organization? Mm -hmm. And so I think leaders are looking for the attributes of people that really care about the organization. They're willing to give their all to the organization and, and, and that they they're going to care for the people that they lead. Uh, you can tell that in five minutes. I can, you know you can show up and you know you can you know what uh general townsend now four star our, our division commander uh when i was a battalion commander he you know what he would do he would go to the movies on the weekends <laughs> and uh when you went to council he was like yeah i talked to three of your soldiers and they told me you do this this so people people know and finding out about you and who you are uh through other means and so that's what uh, that's what I want. I always wanted people that, that were really a part of the team that were committed and being committed. Some people view, you know, your commitment differently. And we've had a lot of conversations, mm -hmm. how you dress good, wrong, bad, or indifferent, how you dress. Do you attend social events? Uh, all those things, some leaders, they want you all in. Yeah. Um, and, and they may judge you based off of that. And so those are some of the things that, uh, I, I think about. Uh, but I think a diverse team is a, is a great thing to have because you're you're going to get different thoughts the organization better. If everybody's the same, you know, you need people to tell you too, like, sir, that's dumb. I mean, I had I had uh, a first sergeant, and he was um, he like, sir, that's dumb as hell. And I was like, okay, all right, <laughs> hey, what, what ideas do you have? And he was, I was like, hey, that sounds like a good idea. Let's get the star major, star major. Wait, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And so you got to be willing too to accept criticism. And then as a leader, the more senior you get, you still got to be willing to change and listen to people and, and and be able to make that change as well. Some of us in leadership may not be willing to hear from that lower rank or that enlisted person. Man, you don't know what you're talking about. I am in this position because I've had my great Colonel Jackson believe in me and my leadership skills. Why should I take your critique? Colonel Jackson, from what I'm hearing, is he endorses someone who wants to keep it real with you. You know, someone with it, someone with a cr a critical point of view that is about team play, not necessarily destroy play, but team play, is what you're saying, right, sir? Uh, absolutely. The best ideas or the best thing I did in command were ideas where it was a change to the plan from a first sergeant, a platoon sergeant. They said, sir, you know, if we did this, we, you know, we could save lives or this would make us more efficient. And so mm -hmm. I think you have to be willing to, as a leader, to listen. And then you got to be willing to change 180 degrees if it yes. makes sense. Yes. If, if, if it makes sense, you know, and, and uh, part of that leadership, another attribute is being approachable. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of leaders mm -hmm. and senior leaders are not approachable. Mm -hmm. And so you have to really be approachable. So people are, aren't afraid to bring up that idea, no matter what rank they are, you know, because they know like, man, this guy, this guy, listen. Okay. You know, speaking on approachability, sir, I am 
thankful that I approached you, yourself and Colonel House, <laughs> we approached you to have this discussion that we had uh, today. You know, I really appreciate the time, uh, the discussion. I'm looking forward to more mentorship from you. I know I'm just a, a former medical officer, but <laughs> I am still looking for some good word mentorship from you because I really appreciate the, the discussion today. Absolutely. No, thanks for having me, Otis. Uh, it's been great. I get passionate about it. Uh, I try to mentor every day. My, you know, my phone rings. I try to reach out and uh, help people. And so uh, I'm also going to send you, I've got some points to each of these two. And so mm -hmm. I'll, I'll send that to you as well. You put those in note page or something yeah. uh, for everybody. But uh, just thanks. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, spend some time with you guys. All right, sir. Salute off to you. I appreciate the help, sir. And we will be All talking right. again, sir. All right. All right. All right. Thanks, Otis. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. So we had another good discussion today. My main camera died, so I'm using my laptop camera. Um, you know, as Colonel Jackson say, hey, seek out the leadership, seek out the opportunities to be a positive impact on someone. And, you know, I think you will follow through. I think you're going to make it. I think you're going to persevere. And as I always say in parting, take care of yourself, take care of your family and take care of others. Peace.